This video will be a quick discussion on the proper ways to use a digital balance. Uh, this is something you'll be using regularly during lab activities and it's something you'll need to discuss when writing lab reports. So a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about today. We'll start with a brief discussion of what a digital balance is and what we use it for. We'll talk about the proper way to set up a digital balance. This involves leveling the balance and also the process of calibrating the balance so that it gives accurate readings. We'll then talk about the actual process of data collection, how to use the digital balance, specifically focusing on the tear function. And finally, we'll start talking about how the balance can introduce error into your experiment, something you can use as a discussion point for your lab reports. To start our discussion on how to use a balance, uh, we'll talk about the general setup of the equipment itself. Uh, the first thing you're going to want to do when you get your balance is first to make sure that it is properly cleaned. Uh, you'll notice the doors on the side and on the top open up, and we can then use a paintbrush to make sure that we brush off any material that was left in here from the previous user. Anything left on the pan of the balance could potentially affect the masses that we're able to record, and as a result, we won't get accurate results. Once the balance is properly cleaned off, we can get started with the actual setup process itself. We can plug the uh, balance into any uh, electrical receptacle. To turn the balance on, we simply press the button here in the center once. You'll see the scale starts to light up with information. Uh, when it reads the value 0, 0.000, you know the balance is ready to actually roll. Once the balance is properly turned on, the next order of business we're interested in is in assuring that the balance is level. Uh, we can talk about the physics of, with this in class, but if the balance is not level, the forces acting from the mass of the object will not match up with the recording that the balance actually reads. To level the balance, we'll notice right here, there is a small leveling bubble. Uh, there is a small bubble floating in liquid. That bubble needs to be at the center of the actual circle that's drawn in the leveling bubble itself. To adjust whether or not the balance is level or not, we can turn the feet towards the back of the balance, which raises up the different sides of the balance until the balance is properly leveled. Once it's leveled, we'll hit the tear button one more time, and that'll get us back to 0.00. The last thing to watch out for with your balance is the, uh, the calibration of the balance itself. Uh, you cannot calibrate the balances that we have. However, you'll notice written on the back of the balance, there should be uh, initials and a date written there to give us an idea of when the last calibration occurred. Uh, you'll want to check that date to make sure that the balance has been uh, calibrated recently. And if not recently, uh, then you can use that as a source of potential error in your experiment. The next phase of the process for using an actual balance is actually making a measurement with the balance. Uh, we've already taken the time to clean and set up and calibrate the device, uh, now we want to record things. Uh, there's basically two different ways we can go about doing this. Uh, we can record solid objects, such as this object right here, or we can uh, make the measurements of uh, a pelleted objects like a chemical, which we can do in a weigh dish. Before we make any of those measurements, however, though, we do got to, again, check to make sure the balance is working properly. One of the things we can definitely do with the balance here is you'll notice here, the, again, the button in the center has this zero slash T marking. Uh, this is a button for either zeroing the balance or tearing the balance. If at any point in time the balance does not read zero, you can press this button and the balance will recalibrate itself so that whatever is on the balance pan reads out as zero grams. It's good practice no matter what when you start using a balance to always hit the tear button to ensure your balance is properly uh, zeroed out. Now that we've zeroed it out, if you want to record the mass of your object, it's very simple. We simply have to open the door, place our object directly on the pan as close to the center as possible, and we will get a mass readout here. You'll notice as the readout occurs, there's an icon, a little asterisk that shows up on the bottom left. That lets us know that the reading has stabilized and is ready to be recorded. If we want to record the mass of something that does not necessarily sit nicely on the balance itself, we can use something like this. This is known as a weighing dish. Now the downside of using a weighing dish is we want to know the, con the mass of the contents of the dish, not the dish itself. In previous science classes, you might have weighed the dish separately, subtracted that mass out, and then got the mass of your items. This balance actually does a lot of that work for us. If you want to use a weighing dish, you first place the dish on the balance itself, and again, it will give you a mass reading of that balance. Uh, as opposed to recording that number down, we can press the zero and tear button again, and the balance will recalibrate itself so that this dish now weighs zero grams. We can then take the dish off the balance, fill it with our chemical, put the dish back on, and then whatever the contents are of the dish, as opposed to the dish itself, is what will read out on the balance itself, and we'll be able to get that actual mass of the contents. When you are done with your sample, the last order of business is to take your chemicals off, 
Make sure, then, once again, the balance is cleaned by using the brush to brush off any chemicals that you might have spilled. This ensures that the balance uh, stay in good shape and it's ready for the next person to use. Last but not least, uh, we do actually have a couple different types of balances that we use here at the high school. Uh, this balance is known as an analytical balance. Uh, it reads a large number of decimal places. In this case, this one reads three decimal places, which gives our measurements a very large number of significant digits. Um, this balance here, it has, conversely, is known as a pan balance. It's a simpler device, and as a result, it reads fewer significant digits. This device only reads one decimal place in grams, usually leading us to answers in the two to three to four significant digit range, as opposed to the five or six significant digits significant digits we expect to get with a device like this. Either device can be used in your experiment, uh, it just depends on the precision you need in the measurements that you make. Last thing we'll point out about the two of these, the analytical balance has these glass doors on the side of it. Because this is so sensitive to small changes in weight, minor fluctuations in air movement from the room, i.e. someone walking by your balance, will cause this thing to give you inaccurate readings. The glass doors prevent that from happening. This balance isn't sensitive enough to detect those slight movements, and as a result, the glass doors are not necessary. At the end of the day, though, both of these are reasonable devices to use to record the mass of a sample. We'll wrap up today's talk on balances with a discussion of the potential sources of error you might run into uh, while using a balance in your experiment. Uh, the first source of error we can see here in the picture. Uh, as you can see, some of the material we're trying to weigh with this balance has been spilled onto the pan. Uh, the problem in this type of a scenario is the mass of that material will be recorded by the pan, uh, but when you remove that material in the dish from the balance itself, you'll have less mass actually used in your experiment by itself. This discrepancy in uh, masses will lead to a assumed larger value or larger mass of material used than you actually are, uh, introducing error into your experiment. The next thing to be concerned about when dealing with error and your balance is the concept of calibration. Calibration, again, is when we take the balance and set it to a standard weight, a weight that we know is exactly a certain number of grams so that the balance actually reads accurate recordings. Calibration is not something that you'll be doing as a student. Uh, however, each balance is regularly calibrated, and you can check on the back of the balance to see when the most recent calibration was. You can make the presumption then that the longer the time is between the most recent calibration and now, the less likely the balance is reading an accurate result. Um, this will have implications when you compare this balance's weight to another balance's weight, uh, but less implications if you use the same balance for all of your trials. The last source of error we'll discuss um, is a little bit different than the others. Uh, those other sources of error are avoidable sources of error. Uh, in this case, we'll be discussing random error, which is error that you can't avoid in your experiment. Uh, every single time you run a trial using any measuring tool, including a balance, you're going to get slight variations in the results you get, and these are all due to factors that you ne can't necessarily control in your experiment. This will lead some values to be a little bit high, some values to be a little bit low, um, which is why we do multiple trials when we perform each experiment. Um, depending on the number of trials you choose to do, you can still get a discrepancy with your average shifting too high or too low. Uh, what this leads us to believe then is that the more trials we can perform using any piece of measuring equipment, uh, the better result we're going to be. It's going to eliminate those random errors. Uh, and mathematically, we can eliminate them by using an average value. To wrap things up, we had a brief discussion on how to properly set up a digital balance. We talked about the process of data collection and specifically when to use and when not to use a weigh dish and when using a weigh dish, uh, how to properly use the tear function. And finally, we had a discussion on how the balance can introduce error into your experiment. Uh, we talked about the error associated with not properly leveling the balance. Uh, we talked about the error associated with not necessarily having the balance recently calibrated. Uh, we talked about what error that the debris on the balance scale can potentially introduce into our experiment. And finally, regardless of how much we work with this, uh, the fact that no matter what we do, we'll always have a certain amount of random error. All of these can be used as potential talking points in your lab reports uh, when trying to analyze how much error in total a balance may have introduced into your experiment.